So a few weeks ago, I made a video on 5 unexplained mysteries in Pokemon Sword and Shield, taking a look at all of the new unanswered questions that we had been greeted to in the brand new generation. Well, not only was that video extremely fun to make and go through, but it seems like you guys really liked it as well, and so because of that, I had the idea to maybe explore some other unexplained mysteries throughout the rest of the Pokemon generations as well. So that is what we are going to be trying here today, maybe the start of a new series if you guys are into this sort of thing, definitely let me know in the comments below, but of course with that being said, we are going to pick things up here with unsolved mysteries or unexplained mysteries about the Kanto region. Obviously, we've got to start with Kanto because Kanto is a part of Generation 1, and we've got some really interesting unanswered or unexplained things within this region and generation that definitely leave you scratching your head, so without any further ado, why don't we go ahead and take a look. The first one of these that I want to get into today is the question of why was the Pokemon Tower replaced with the Radio Tower? As we all know, one of the most iconic landmarks in all of the Kanto region is the Pokemon Tower that resides in Lavender Town, which is one of the most iconic locations in the region as well. However, three years later during the events of Generation 2, the iconic Pokemon Tower, filled with the graves of dead Pokemon no less, was completely replaced with the Radio Tower, much to the shock of Pokemon fans everywhere. And even though, according to the games, the graves from the Pokemon Tower were maintained and placed into the new House of Memories, it does still seem odd to take such an iconic location that held such reverence to it and replace it with such an insignificant type of thing, like a radio tower, that you cannot even really explore past the first floor. It would be very, very nice to know why the Pokemon Tower of all places was replaced by the Radio Tower of all things. The game does give a very brief explanation saying that radio is basically all the rage and they wanted to bring it to the Kanto region, but to be honest, that's not really a good enough of a reason to completely tear down a location like this that held such a unique atmosphere to it. And from a gameplay standpoint, it's certainly not good enough of a reason considering that once again, we only got to explore the first floor of this radio tower. Why was radio so important that it had to replace such a sacred site? And given that Team Rocket has a keen interest in the radio tower in the Gen 2 games, could they have had any influence into this decision as well? All of this seems very strange and has since the inception of the Generation 2 games, and obviously with the lack of any concrete answer, these kinds of questions are going to continue to arise within the Pokemon community until maybe someday we get a more definitive answer explanation. Another curious mystery that lies within the Kanto region is the story of Mewtwo within the games. We obviously know what happens to Mewtwo within the anime, and the anime is of course based on the games, but the anime certainly does take a very different role a lot of the time, and within the games themselves, the entire story of Mewtwo was set up, only for it to never be addressed in any official capacity within the game itself, which definitely leaves me scratching my head to say the least, and I don't think I'm alone on this one either. For instance, there is the presence of the Pokemon Mansion, which not only details the creation of Mewtwo itself, most likely on Cinnabar Island, but it is also completely abandoned and is basically ransacked by the time you finally get there within the game. Now, after some further digging, it becomes revealed or heavily implied that the Pokemon Mansion once belonged to Mr. Fuji, who also has a connection to the anime as the person who oversaw the creation of Mewtwo in the first first Pokemon movie was also known as Dr. Fuji. It is also heavily implied that Blaine, who remains on Cinnabar Island, was actually the brother of Mr. Fuji as well, who also assisted in the creation of Mewtwo. So the question here is, how exactly was Mewtwo created in the games? What was the process of it being created? Why was the Pokemon Mansion eventually abandoned entirely? And why did Mr. Fuji completely leave, never to even talk about the project again? And furthermore, why did Blaine stay on the island despite his brother leaving, and what role did he have to play in the creation of Mewtwo himself? 
Based on the first Pokemon movie, there is a lot we can infer about this. You could say that Mr. Fuji created Mewtwo, but then was ashamed of the thing that he had created after it got too powerful, so he basically sent himself into exile into Lavender Town. That is basically the best guesstimate we can give at this time, but nevertheless, it seemed so odd, and still does seem odd, that you would have all of these heavy plot devices placed in the game, only for them to never really matter in terms of the overall plot of the game itself. Because it would have been really, really cool to play through some kind of Mewtwo story arc and learn more about the past of Mewtwo within the games themselves. But with the coming and going of Kanto's not even first, but second remake in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, with no explanation or development offered whatsoever, I think it's pretty safe to say that we are never going to get to see these elements of the Kanto games resolved or explored anytime soon. This next mystery is a classic one that has been discussed by Pokemon fans many times over over the years, and that is the question of what exactly happened between Professor Oak and Agatha. Once you finally arrive to the Elite Four and face off against Agatha, we learn very, very briefly that her and Professor Oak had some kind of relationship, and she refers to him as, at one point, tough and handsome, but now seems to almost hate him. So with this complete 180 in opinion, it's pretty safe to say that Professor Oak and Agatha at one point had a close relationship with one another, but over the years had a falling out for some reason, and now don't even seem to to like each other at all. And the specifics as to what exactly happened is the big point of contention here. Agatha implies that Professor Oak opting for Pokemon research as opposed to battling is the reason why she resents him so much, but to me and to a lot of other Pokemon fans, this kind of seems like an excuse for her to hate Professor Oak rather than the actual reason. Many people have theorized, and rightfully so, that Professor Oak and Agatha could have had a romantic relationship at one point before it turned sour, which is ultimately what led to the feelings of resentment, which is completely understandable. However, we obviously don't know, and because this one instance, the only time you truly see Agatha within any of the games, is the only time where we hear anything about their relationship in any form, obviously makes it very hard to infer anything more, and once again, just like with the previous mystery, the fact that Game Freak chose to not develop this any further despite having the perfect opportunity to do so in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee pretty much puts the final nail in the coffin that we are never going to be able to find out what happened between these two. Another interesting question that has ties to the anime, but is never explained within the games themselves, is the fate of the SS Anne. The SS Anne is obviously the famous cruise ship which you get to board in the Generation 1 games, but after you depart the ship and the SS Anne leaves on its voyage, we never see it again within the games, and it is in fact replaced by the SS Aqua in Generation 2, which takes place just three years after the Generation 1 titles. The fact that it was replaced by the SS Aqua to me is the most puzzling thing here, because with the inclusion of Kanto in Generation 2, it seems like Game Freak would want to play on nostalgia here, and including an iconic part of the Generation 1 games like the SS Anne, which would have been the exact way that you would have made your way to the Kanto region, much like the SS Aqua is in the actual games, seems like the perfect way to do just that. So the fact that it was replaced by the SS Aqua in Generation 2 and we never saw the SS Anne again after it set sail for that first time definitely leads you to ask the question of what exactly happened to it. Obviously, in the anime, we do get to see the fate of the SS Anne, and that is that it sunk to the bottom of the ocean. But just because it happened in the anime does not mean that that necessarily happened in the games, because as I said, the anime is only loosely based on the games and can definitely take take a number of different liberties as it sees fit in order to tell its own story. It's certainly possible that the SSN sunk in the games, but the fact of the matter is, we just do not know for sure. Many people have also connected the SSN to Looker in that it's possible that he was on board during the Generation 1 games, and maybe even washed up ashore in the Hoenn region as a result of that voyage, but once again, we don't know for sure. All we can do is speculate at this point, and it's just another one of those things that Game Freak decided they weren't going to explain, and it definitely seems like we are 
are not going to get an explanation at all in the future either. And the final mystery we are going to talk about today is also the most recently developed of them all because it came about just last year, and that would be the mysterious yet fascinating Red and Green Beta. About a year ago, the team over at Helix Chamber revealed that they had made a monumental discovery. Tons of unused beta elements from the original build of Pokemon Red and Green that included a number of cut Pokemon, characters, and possibly even story elements as well. While this revelation did answer a couple of significant questions like what Gorochu actually looked like or the fact that Kangaskhan and Cubone were in fact related at one point, it definitely brought about a bunch more questions as well that it did not have a full answer to. For instance, there are a number of Pokemon included in this beta that were completely cut from the game. However, the only thing that was recovered about them was their back sprites, so even though we know what the back of them looks like in 8-bit form, we don't really have any idea whatsoever what they truly look like in terms of their front side and their faces. There was also a number of cut human characters as well, some who look very interesting to say the least, and probably had a role to play in what was very likely a different story for the game overall. We do know from years back that originally the Viridian Gym was going to be the first gym instead of the last gym, so this is just an inkling of what was switched around for the final release, and this gives us a little bit more of an insight to it, but not enough. And like I said, thanks to the very unique and original cut characters that were recovered, we can only begin to wonder what this original story would have been like. It also makes you wonder that if this much from the original Pokemon games that are over 20 years old can still be recovered after all of this time, what else about the development of these games do we still not know about? Are there still cut Pokemon that have yet to be discovered? Are there still cut characters that have yet to be discovered? Once again, what was the story for this original version of the games and will we ever be able to find out any details about it at all? These are questions that I would absolutely love the answer to, but it could very well be another 20 years before we get any more information whatsoever, so we are just going to have to cross our fingers, hope for the best, and just wait and see. Well, there you have it everybody, those were five unexplained mysteries from the Kanto region. Now, as I said at the beginning of the video, I would love to make this into a series, but if I'm going to be able to do that, I need to know it's something that you guys want to see. So if that is the case, be sure to share this video around, let me know in the comments below, and if this video does well enough, then I will definitely consider doing a Johto video as well as the rest of the regions as well. If you guys like the video though, once again, leave a like, it really helps, and if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe for more new Pokemon content all the time. If you would like to support the channel further as well, you can check me out on Spotify for my Pokemon remixes and my Pokemon Cardinal project if you haven't seen that yet either. With all of that being said though, I will be back on Saturday with another video, so be sure to hit that notification bell so you can know as soon as it goes live, and with all of that being said, I love you guys very much, and until the next one, as always, I will smell you guys later.